good morning or whatever time of day it is that you are listening. We are kicking off Unit 3 Energy Flow by talking about enzymes and biochemical reactions. So this entire unit is about what it's called. It's about energy flow or the flow of energy. We're going to talk about energy and the source of it on Earth, which is for almost all things the sun, how that energy from the sun gets captured and converted into a form that can, it can be stored on Earth, and then how then we as humans and other consumers, how we obtain that energy in that form, and then how we break it down and convert it into a usable form for our cells to do all the different processes that they need to do. So we're tackling this big concept. We're going to be looking at it on a really small scale today and, um, and in concepts two, four, and five, and then we'll look at it in a larger scale in concept three. So just kind of stick with me, especially through concept one and two. We're just going to be hitting a lot of background information here, and I'm going to try to simplify it as much as possible for you. Okay, so first, I want to define the word metabolism. You may have heard it when if someone has said, I have a fast metabolism or I have a slow metabolism, but here's what it actually means. Your metabolism is all of the chemical reactions within each cell of an organism. And when someone says they have a fast metabolism, they're basically just saying they have a really efficient um, metabolic system, if you will, of processing food for energy. Um, but I digress. That's not what we're talking about here. I want you to understand it in the scope of biology. So we're looking at all of these chemical reactions and there's so many that are happening. These reactions are doing a ton of things, but one of the main roles they have is to provide energy for life's processes. Remember, the cell is the most basic unit of life. So we're doing this on a cellular level and then that's working up to keep the organism um, alive. Also, these chemical reactions are creating key molecules that do signaling, that do different processes, that, that um, transport energy to the places it needs to go. They just do so many things. This is what we're looking at here. And when I say chemical reactions, this is what I mean. A chemical reaction is the breaking and forming of bonds between different substances that occurs during a chemical change. So you may remember from physical science, I can take a piece of paper and I can crumple it into a ball. That is a physical change because I'm, I'm not changing the paper. The paper is still paper. I've just changed the physical property of it. I've just changed the shape of it. But if I take that paper and I set it on fire, a chemical reaction occurs. That's a combustion reaction. New substances are being made. Um, and so that's what we're talking here of the chemical reaction. We're taking substances, we're rearranging them on a chemical level and creating new substances. Now, this involves energy, and this is kind of complicated to understand. So I'm again, I'm going to do my best just to simplify it for you. Overall, reactions absorb or release energy. And technically, even that statement is not fully accurate. All reactions are absorbing and releasing energy. They're doing both, but we're looking at a net overall is more absorbed or more being released. When a bond is broken, every time a bond is broken, a chemical bond, this requires energy to be absorbed. Bonds don't just break without an input of energy, okay? Forming a bond always allows energy to be released, okay? Now, the law of conservation of energy, this is the first law of thermodynamics, which you'll learn more about in chemistry or AP bio or whatever you take after this. But due to the law of conservation of energy, no energy in the overall system is ever lost. It's just changing forms. Okay, so when we say that energy is released, um, it's not just disappearing. It just may be becoming a different form. That form could be heat. It could be light. There's a lot of different things. But it's important that you and really important that you all understand that all reactions are both releasing and absorbing energy. But we're just looking at the net overall either gained or the net overall loss, which I say with quotation marks, of um, energy. One thing that I find extremely helpful as a visual learner are these energy diagrams. So we're going to be looking at these. They show how the amount of energy 
changes as the reaction progresses. And sometimes you'll look at these and they'll say time down here or reaction progress. It's referring to the same thing. So when we're looking at biochemical reactions, biochemical just means chemical reactions occurring in living things. We see that they're either catabolic or anabolic. A catabolic reaction is taking larger molecules and breaking them down into smaller compounds. Now, we just said to break bonds, that requires an input of energy, and that's true. But in a catabolic reaction, the overall reaction releases energy, which is exergonic. An anabolic reaction is building up larger molecules from smaller ones, and that's going to require us to um, consume more energy to do it than gets released by the forming of the new bonds, and so it's an overall endergonic reaction. All reactions require energy to happen. They're not just going to spontaneously occur. Um, so that energy that's required to get it going is called the activation energy. It's the amount of energy needed to make a chemical reaction start. And it's pictured right here on an energy diagram. So if we go back, at the beginning of a reaction, that's when we have the reactant. So however much energy is in those reactants in their bonds. We're going to input energy, that's our activation energy, just to get the reaction started. And then over here, as the reaction progresses, this is showing the energy level of the products. So in this reaction, we can see that we started more and we ended with less. So energy, there was an overall release in energy. Even though there was absorbing and releasing throughout as bonds were broken and formed, overall in this reaction, this is showing an exergonic reaction as energy was overall released. So I said some words like reactants and products. Let's pause and define those. Reactants are also known as substrate in biology. These are substances that are changed during the chemical reaction. Think of them as the ingredients in the reaction. The products are the substances that are made by the chemical reaction. So it's the results at the end of the reaction. All right, two words that we need to know in biology are endo and exothermic. Endo, think in, therm, think um, heat. We're bringing in heat. Endothermic reactions overall absorb energy in the form of usually heat or light. An example of this is photosynthesis. So the overall amount of energy that's required to break the bonds in the reactants is more than the energy that gets released when the new bonds are formed in the products. And that's where we get this endothermic reaction. We start with less energy, we have to input a ton of energy to get it going, and then we end with more. Thus, there's an overall absorbing of energy in the form of, in photosynthesis, light from the sun. Exothermic reactions release energy. So think exiting in the, in the form of heat or light. So exiting heat, exothermic. This is how cellular respiration works. So these are two critical biochemical reactions. So the overall amount of energy that's required to break the bonds in the reactants in cellular respiration is less than the energy that gets released when the new bonds form in the products. And so thus there's excess energy considered to be released as heat or light and it's an exothermic reaction. So again, we start with more, we're ending with less in exothermic. So I mentioned photosynthesis and cellular respiration. These are two critical biochemical reactions and that they're what we're gonna be spending the most of this unit talking about. So this first reaction, you will need to memorize this and know this. It is photosynthesis. It is, think of this as a recipe. This chemical equation is just a recipe. It says that we need six carbon dioxides and six waters, and we're, that will make or yield or produce one glucose, C6H12O6, and six oxygen molecules. And this is photosynthesis. This happens because of light energy. Often you'll see sun or light above this arrow right here. Light energy gets stored from the sun as chemical energy in the form of sugar. This C6H12O6, that's sugar, that's glucose. And overall, it's an endothermic reaction because it's we're absorbing more than is being released as um, the products are formed. Now, the opposite of this is cellular respiration. One glucose plus six oxygens yields six carbon dioxides and six waters and a big release of energy. 
That chemical energy in sugar gets converted to chemical energy released in the form of a molecule called ATP, which we'll learn about next time. And again, the overall reaction is exothermic because the amount of energy that's needed to, um, to be absorbed to break these bonds is less than the amount of energy that gets released when these new bonds are formed. Okay, so let's talk about enzymes. These are extremely important for metabolic reactions. All metabolic reactions, so all these chemical reactions we're talking about in your body that keep you alive from at a cellular level, they're all controlled by enzymes. Enzymes are mainly proteins. Remember that macromolecule that does so many things? Yep, that's enzymes. And what they do is they speed up biochemical reactions by lowering the activation energy, meaning they make it take less energy to get the reaction going. Because they're speeding up reactions, we also call them catalysts. Catalysts are substances that speed up reactions without being permanently altered. So an enzyme is something that helps the process, but it's not changing the process. So for example, if you've ever made cookies, you have your reactants, your ingredients would be your chocolate chips, your flour, your butter, your sugar, whatever. The product, the end result would be chocolate chip cookies. And I can make cookies by hand. Like I can stir the ingredients together with a spoon and put it together. An enzyme would be like an electric mixer. It would be something that it's not an ingredient. It's, we wouldn't put that as an ingredient. And it's not a product. You don't eat electric mixer when you eat your ending cookies. But it's something that makes the whole process happen faster because I can put in less energy to make the cookies if I have an electric mixer. That is exactly how an enzyme works. It's not changing the starting and ending results. It's just changing the amount of energy it takes to get everything going. Think about the amount of energy it would take to push this ball up this hill to get it to roll down. What we're saying is an enzyme would make this hill, this activation energy, lower so that you don't have to put as much energy in to get the ball to roll down the hill. Now, one important thing with enzymes is they all of the reactions that they make happen faster, they can all occur on their own just super slowly. So that's why we need the enzymes to act as catalysts um, just to get things going um, quicker. So enzymes are very specialized molecules. They bind to reactants, aka your substrate, and they help to break or form bonds. So they're kind of facilitating these reactions, and then they release a newly created product. So what we can see from this picture is enzymes are not changed and they can be used over and over again. Just like I can use my electric mixer over and over again, an enzyme can be used over and over again. So we can see in this picture, we have an enzyme, we have substrate that attaches to it and binds. Then we have the chemical reaction occurring and being facilitated by the enzyme and then the enzyme releases the products. Notice that the enzyme is not changed in this picture. That's really important. Y'all, these enzymes are so critical for regulating life's processes, either allowing things to happen or preventing things to happen from happening. And so they, are, they just play such a key role in all of these reactions. Like I said, enzymes are incredibly specific. Let's say this is a picture of an enzyme. They have something called an active site, okay? Then it only fits one substrate or reactant. Okay, so notice how this fits in here. That's really important. Once the substrate connects, the bind tightens here, and it causes an induced fit. So when I was growing up and in biology, we called it the lock and key model to show that enzymes were really specific, like a lock and a key and a lock, and they only fit in certain places. But really, that's not entirely accurate. It's more like a baseball and a catcher's mitt. So when someone throws a baseball, if you have a catcher's mitt on and you catch the ball, your hand, when that ball connects, it grips down on the ball and that bind tightens. It's called an induced fit and that's what we see with an enzyme. So again, enzymes can facilitate the breaking of bonds in the substrate to form um, two products like we see here. Um, enzymes can also facilitate the formation of bonds between two substrates to make one product. So it can facilitate catabolic or anabolic reactions. It doesn't matter. Now, what happens 
if that enzyme's active site gets deformed. That's called denaturation. If the enzyme's active site loses its very specific shape, we have a loss of biological activity. It, the enzyme cannot do what it was designed to do. And this can be a cause by a lot of things. Um, environmental changes like uh, extreme change in pH or temperature. Um, a lot of enzymes work in a very specific temperature or pH range. And so if it gets outside of that range, um, that can cause denaturation. Some enzymes can be renatured and return to their original shape, but not always. And so that's really important um, to consider. Now, there are a lot of ways that the rate of these chemical reactions that are happening in our bodies can be affected. I'm just going to focus on highlighting five of them, but again, there are a lot more. So one way the overall rate of a reaction can be affected is by temperature, like I mentioned. In general, if you increase the temperature, it's going to increase the rate of the reaction. This is because of the kinetic molecular theory you may remember from physical science. The molecules are moving faster and then they're colliding more with each other, which should cause them to react more with each other. But again, if it gets outside of a certain range, that can cause that denaturation like we just talked about. pH is a measure of how acidic a solution is that a reaction may be occurring in. And most enzymes, again, they only work in a really specific range. So if that pH changes, that can affect um, the rate of the reaction. Um, another thing that can affect it is the substrate concentration. So the higher the amount of substrate, the amount of ingredients you have, the faster the reaction. Again, with that kinetic molecular theory, there should be more particle collisions if there's more substrate, which should cause more reactions. Catalysts, like Lee said, like enzymes, they speed up reactions by lowering the activation energy needing to get them started. That plays a huge role. There's also something called competitive inhibitors. These can slow down a reaction by competing with the substrate for the active site. So remember we said there's only, um, you know, only certain things can fit in that spot and a competitive inhibitor can get in the way of that. And there's a lot of different types of inhibitors. There's competitive and non-competitive. There's allosteric regulation. This type of inhibition can be reversible or irreversible. Um, this is all stuff I'll get into with my AP Bio students, but I just want to introduce you to some of the factors that can affect the rate of a chemical reaction. And so I hope this was a helpful introduction.